Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another installment of our Lunch and Learn webinar series. I'm your host, Meyer Thacker, and I'll be walking through uh, today's topic here, uh, which is titled Anatomy of the Multibagger. Uh, so stocks that multiply over 10 times and basically how to find them. So let's get started with that. Um, and just for a little bit of housekeeping, I'm just going to put up this disclosure here. So please do review that um, when you do get a chance. And what we're going to talk about today is a little bit of a different subject. Um, so what exactly are we aiming for with this whole idea of looking for multibaggers? So the idea here that we want to try to work on in terms of you know getting, which is finding companies that are basically a long-term buy and hold approach. We don't want to get involved in trading. We don't want to be able to you know have you know skills with regards to timing, exact entry and exit points. We want to be able to look for companies that we can buy and hold for a long time and allow the compound effect, uh, compound interest to work its magic in uh, you know, developing an initial investment into a multi-bagger return, meaning a multiple of what you originally invested in the company. So we're looking again for investing rather than trading. And we wanna do this with the mindset that we're buying a business, not a stock, right? So we have to always remember and remind ourselves in this way uh, that when you when you do buy shares of a company, you're effectively buying a business, right? And it's no different from if you were to own it entirely rather than owning just a tiny you know, portion of it. You know, this is something that Warren Buffett has talked about for many, many years now, that there is no difference fundamentally between buying a business outright and owning a tiny piece of that business. It's the same mindset that we need to have you know, going into it. It's the same level of due diligence and it's the same level of involvement. Um, even if you're not involved in the day-to-day -day management of the company, you still need to be fully aware of the competitive risks uh, and how your company is positioned to succeed in the long run. And we want to look for secular growth. So we don't want to find companies that are tied to specific economic conditions, such as interest rates or commodity prices and whatnot. So here's an example of what we don't want. Um, this is a chart of Cleveland Cliffs, ticker CLF. And this is the largest iron ore uh, miner and manufacturer in North America. And you can see here that, you know, if you do actually get the right timing, if you do make the proper uh, forecast of where iron ore prices are going to go, then you could easily net a multi-bag with Cleveland Clips. You can see that here. It's gone from, you know, $4 or under $4 a share at one point to all the way up to $86 and beyond that. And it's had these massive drawdowns, you know, during those time periods in between. But again, if you did time it properly, you could have bought this during the depths of the COVID crash last year in 2020. You got in at $4 and it would already be a multi-bagger right now at over $19 a share. So this is an example of a multi-bagger that only occurs because of deep cyclicality with regards to the underlying economic conditions that the company operates in namely iron ore prices. So the company here, as you can see, the stock price correlates very, very highly with its earnings and its earnings in turn correlates very, very highly with the price of iron ore. So again, this is a company that does one thing really well, which is mine iron ore, but what they cannot do is grow in a secular fashion meaning their entire fate is determined by the price of iron ore, which is outside of their control. So this is not what we want, right? And this is great for, you know, strategists, or if it's great for people that have economic forecasting skills uh, to be able to know exactly when the price of iron ore is going to skyrocket, that would be a great time to be buying this company, but um, that's not what we're here for. We want to be fundamental investors. We want to know, um, you know, what is it that the company is doing fundamentally to grow itself independent of outside forces that the company does not have direct control over. So as a contrast to Cleveland Cliffs, here we have Monster Beverage. And Monster Beverage is exactly the type of multi bagger that we want to find. Uh, Monster Beverage is actually a member of the, our earnings certain portfolio. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a member of that long-term buy and hold portfolio of companies that have had extremely stable, extremely smooth earnings growth over time. 
And you can see that through these recessionary periods of the 2008-2009 crash and even during the COVID crash, you can see that Monster's earnings growth was basically unaffected during both of those time periods here. So this is an example of a secular growth company. This company is not tied to any kind of underlying economic conditions. It's not tied to the price of a certain commodity. It's not tied to where interest rates are or what the Fed is doing or you know, what anything else is actually happening in the world. You can see that through two recessions, uh, they have continued to grow and compound capital at a very high rate for a long time. And that's exactly why they are a member of our uh, exclusive uh, earning certain portfolio. And you can get more information about that. Um, if you, uh, you know, do want more information about that portfolio, you know, please do shoot us an email at zrs at zax.com. And we'd love to you know, get uh, some more information about that portfolio over to you. So this is exactly the type of multi-bagger that we want to search for. So let's take a look at some of the tools that we have to possibly look for companies that do match that criteria. But the biggest question before we do that is what is the, those, what are those criteria? What was the underlying set of conditions that allowed this to occur? And also what we wanna you know, think about as well is, we're not necessarily saying that you have to get in on the ground floor, right? There's this thing that a lot of investors have, a lot of uh, you know, market psychology out there says that you know, once a stock is already doubled or tripled, everyone thinks it's too late. Oh man, we missed that rally. It's over. You know, we can't get in now. We're getting in way too late here. That's not the right way to think about it. Because if you understand what the end trajectory of the company is, meaning what is the total addressable market that the company is competing in? And if the company has a competitive product portfolio, and if, the and if the company has, you know, attractive branding or some other competitive advantage that they can defend for a long time, then it follows that even if the company has doubled or tripled from the price that you uh, initially saw it at, you can still, you know, forecast what the growth would be as it, you know, grows into that total addressable market. So we know that Monster in this case was, you know, attacking a massive, you know, 100 billion plus market, which is the beverage market, right? We know what Monster does. They make energy drinks, carbonated en energy drinks. And that was a brand new category when they first started this along with Red Bull. They were, Red Bull and Monster kind of did this together. They were the first, they were the first two to market, um, you know, uh, in that new uh, nascent category. But we know that the, in the beverage market, meaning the, the soda market is already, an enormous market with Pepsi and Coke being the two behemoths of that world. And Monster comes along and because of their aggressive branding and marketing campaign, uh, and of course, you know, with a product that everybody loved, we can see that they started to eat into that market share. They started to eat into, you know, eat into that massive total addressable market. So even if you, you know, were late to the party and you got in even during, you know, this time right here during this, you know, little pullback or even during this pullback which would have been great you would have still gotten in very very early on because if you keep in mind where what is the trajectory of this company long term forget about where they have come from in the past even if the stock is already tripled or quadrupled right if we can look ahead and see what the size of the total addressable market is and what the current market penetration is into that total addressable market then you can say with confidence that we still have, you know, a double to go. We still have a triple to go. We still have a quadruple to go with regards to revenue growth opportunity. So that's what we have to do. So what are those criteria? You know, I've already listed two of them, but let's take a definitive look at what those criteria are. And I've built a general framework here that helps us understand and helps us pick, you know, very high likely potential multi-baggers uh, like Monster Energy. So step number one, and, and if you um, you know walk through this, you'll notice that you know Monster checks off every one of these boxes here. So we start from this one, right? This is the most obvious one. We want companies that are experiencing exponential revenue growth and market adoption. In a nutshell, what does revenue growth mean, right? Revenue growth means that uh, the the marketplace, customers, clients 
uh, other businesses, whoever the company's uh, clientele are, are voting, are placing a vote of confidence in the company. So as a company experiences exponential growth in revenue, that means that more and more people are voting with their dollars and endorsing what the company is doing. So that's what that revenue growth really tells you there uh, is increasing market adoption. That's the first step to identifying a potential multi-bagger. After that, we want to know, okay, well, what's the, what's the total addressable market like? Right? Because we know that again, if we go back and say we see that you know Monster grew, you know, it's uh, it's revenue at uh, double or triple in the early going. But what if the total addressable market was only about that size? Right back then, uh, Monster was only doing a was only doing a couple hundred million dollars in sales. Well, in that case, what if the total addressable market for for that category was only, let's say, a billion dollars? Then in that case, they've already, uh, you know, usurped the majority of that TAM. And so the growth opportunities after that point become much, much more difficult, unless if the company pivots or expands its product portfolio to expand its total addressable market, right? So we want to do some research, right? We need to understand what is the total size of the market opportunity that the company is attacking. And we want to look at that number relative to the size of the enterprise value today. So what's enterprise value again? That's just the market cap of the stock plus its net debt, right? So that's the total debt minus cash on the balance sheet. That gives you your enterprise value. So the bigger the TAM relative to the enterprise value, the bigger the upside potential is for that company to continue that revenue growth. Right. So, of, of course, if we look at exponential revenue growth, that's only telling you what has happened in the past. Right. But we want to know, well, is that past performance indicative of future results? Right. And if they've already usurped a majority of their total addressable market, then, you know, the past growth rate may not continue going forward. And then it becomes a broken growth story. So to avoid that trap of, you know, falling, you know, prey to a broken growth story. We want to make sure that the total addressable market is a very, very large multiple of the of the enterprise value today. What that multiple is, I can't say exactly for sure. It can be, you know, it's not an exact science uh, per se, but I like to use a sort of, um, you know, a rule of thumb here, which is that if the total addressable market is greater than 10 times the enterprise value today, then that presents a very, very attractive opportunity. Um, but 10 is not a magic number. It could be five, it could be six, um, but something close to 10 would be preferable. Um, and so the bigger that number, the better it is, um, you know, for a, you know, the potential for picking a multi-bagger company. Then what we want to know is there has to be a why behind all of this, right? We see the exponential revenue growth historically. We see that there's a massive total addressable market relative to enterprise value, but in order for that to continue to grow, in order for the revenue to continue to eat into that total addressable market, there has to be a why behind it. There has to be a major why. So what are those whys, right? There has to be something that's driving that. There has to be something that makes this continue. Why should customers continue to adopt this company's product or service? And that is what we need to find out as the next step. So if the company is solving a major pain point, that is a major why, that is a major tailwind for the company for it to continue to eat into that total addressable market. Or if the company is cutting costs, that is another very, very competitive reason for why it should continue to grow into that total addressable market. If the company has a first mover advantage, right? Or runaway network effects, that's also another reason for why you know, the company can continue to eat into that total addressable market. So points number three and four are kind of, you know, sort of one, one category here, which is the why, right? If you're solving a major pain point or cutting costs, and if you have first mover advantage or have runaway network effects, then that gives you a very, very strong backing or a tailwind for the, you know, for the company to continue its exponential revenue growth and continue eating share into that total addressable market. So we see this as, for example, you know, a runaway network effect 
Um, an example of that is Facebook, right? We have Facebook, which is a, the largest social networking platform in the world. Facebook, you know, has something that may be competed away by other companies because I mean, let's face it, how hard is it to just design a website for people to use and to share content and to share ideas and thoughts and other things like that? How hard is it to build a platform where people can message each other? That's essentially what Facebook is. And Google tried to do this, right? Google did try to um, eat into Facebook's you know, success and they created you know, Google Plus a few years ago. This was about 10 years ago and it was a giant flop. Why? Because Google Plus you know, is, Although they are no stranger to software development, Google could easily re recreate, you know, what Facebook has done. But, you know, Google ultimately was a me too product. Facebook was already hitting runaway network effects. It had over a billion users that are using it every single day. And there's no reason for those users to run away from Facebook and to go to someone else like Google. Why should they when Google Plus is just a me too product? So Facebook has runaway network effects. Once you have a platform where there are a critical mass of users that are on that platform, it's very, very difficult for a company to steal that thunder. We see the same thing happening with uh, Zillow. You know, Zillow is another site where the vast majority of people refer to when uh, you know looking for you know real estate, either for rental properties or to buy. So Zillow also has a runaway network effect. They also have first mover advantage, just like Facebook does. So again, uh, this is a very, very strong indication of a moat, right? If the company has very, very strong network effects, meaning they dominate the volume, the sheer volume of a specific uh, you know, industry or service, then it's very difficult to steal that away. Unless if the, you know, the competing product does something much, much more desirable, or can actually solve a pain point that you're not doing, or if they're cutting costs to such an extent that uh, that you're not able to do. So again, uh, we want you know one of these four items to be satisfied. They should have first mover advantage, and they should be doing either one of these two here. So we want either you know we want one of point number three, and one of point number four. If we can have just one of each of those points, then we have solved you know, that necessary step for identifying multi-baggers. And then point number five, which is very, very important as well, right? equally important as everybody else, but we want companies that are generating strong returns on invested capital and retained earnings. This is a very critical point that we have to understand here. Um, Warren Buffett explains as to why you know, Berkshire Hathaway was able to grow and make you know billions and hundreds of billions of dollars for their shareholders and it's specifically because and primarily because they have retained all their earnings when a company retains its earnings that means that it has opportunities to invest that or those earnings and if they're investing those earnings at a very strong rate of return which is their roic then that is what is building compound growth internally within the company so if a company is retaining all of its earnings, right, and if it's reinvesting it back into itself and earning a strong return on that invested capital, then what's happening is you're generating compound growth. That is the most powerful force in all of finance. And Einstein once said that compound interest is the most powerful force in the universe, right? And that's exactly what we want here is companies that are retaining as much earnings as possible, ideally 100% of their earnings and reinvesting it back into a high ROIC. That's what's going to grow earnings long term. Also, what's important here is to note that companies that have a strong ROIC tend to have a higher multiple at the exit point, meaning the end time. The terminal multiple of a company with a strong ROIC relative to its cost of capital ends up trading at a higher terminal multiple than companies that have a lower ROIC, all things held equal. So this is also very important for us as investors because we want to make sure that we, we don't run into valuation risk. Because a company could grow right exponentially, but once it hits that uh, sort of uh, crest at the top of the hill and doesn't grow as fast as it once did, 
if the company does not do a strong ROIC, then its multiple will actually converge back to the industry average. And if the earnings have not grown you know, to a large enough extent, then that multiple compression could actually mean losses for, for us as the investor, or it could at least mean very, very muted return over that time frame. So this is very important to note here. We want companies that generate strong returns on invested capital, and we want them to do this on 100% retained earnings so that we create a compound growth effect for the company. And this is related to number six as well. We want a reasonable valuation. We'll walk through a couple of very, very simple examples on how to, uh, to value a company. And then if you can get number seven, this is even better. If we can get all six of these um, satisfied, and then if you can buy into the stock when there is a pessimistic short-term market sentiment, then you've locked into a very, very attractive uh, investment opportunity. So let's walk through this. So let's take an example of all seven of these here, or really all six of these, and we'll talk about the seventh one at the very end. And let's find out what is a, what is a company that does you know, potentially meet all six of these criteria. And now that brings us to uh, the company in question. And I should also just mention this as well, um, just as a study that I wanted to note here as well. This is a study that was done by Credit Suisse. And um, this, you know, sort of, uh, you know, depicts exactly why ROIC is so critical to identify multi-backers. And you can see here that they've done a historical regression analysis. And what they found was, is that as a company generates a larger return on invested capital over and above its discount rate, that's what this x-axis is showing, the spread between the uh, CFROI, which is the cash flow return on investment, minus the discount rate. So this is the spread of the company's rate of return on capital and its cost of capital. As that spread increases, you can see here that the market assigns a higher multiple to the gross investment that the company has deployed. That is the retained earnings portion of it. So as the company retains more and more earnings, and as it has a, you know, generates a higher and higher spread between the return on investment and its cost of capital, then its terminal multiple to those retained earnings increases as we go. And that's exactly what we want here is companies that generate, you know, high returns on capital relative to its cost of capital. And that way, you know, the terminal multiple that the company will ultimately trade at even when growth slows is going to be higher than companies that don't do such a high spread. This is why it's very, very critical. And you can see that the correlation between these two factors is 83%. That is very, very compelling. So this is why we want to pick companies that have a very large and healthy spread between the rate of return on its, on its invested capital and its cost of capital. So what is a company that does meet this criteria? And here we come to ServiceNow, ticker N-O-W. So let's walk through that. Why do I think ServiceNow is, you know, or satisfies, you know, the six major criteria for a multi-bagger, similar to how Monster did it, you know, a dec over a decade ago. So here we have ServiceNow, and this is, we're looking at our price, price and earnings uh, view from ZRS, that's the Zach's research system. And you can see that, you know, right off the bat, uh, the Zach's rank is currently rated as a buy. That means that analysts are very, very bullish uh, on the company, both in the short term and the long term, as we can see with the long term growth trajectory of the company. But the Zach's rank being a shorter term, you know, momentum model over the next three to six months, that's also very, very bullish uh, right now in terms of its current conditions. And so we can see here that prior to 2018, the company was still building scale. And since the very tail end of 2018 into early 2019, we see that they have now hit profitability and have grown profitability ever since. And you can see that they have grown that bottom line even through the recession of 2020. And so this is exactly what we wanna see here, just like what Monster did throughout 2008, 2009 and throughout 2020, you know, Monster grew on a secular basis. So they were not affected by the, uh, the economic cycles of 2008 and 2020, um, they were growing on its own merit. 
And that's exactly what we see with ServiceNow happening right now on this price and earnings view. So what does ServiceNow do? Let's take a look at who they are and why they are you know, growing the way that they are. So ServiceNow is the fastest growing SaaS company at scale in the world. They essentially have built a platform, which they call the Now platform, and it allows enterprises to automate complex and often laborious workflows. You know, it allows companies to cut costs and increase employee productivity. So what does the Now platform do? It's essentially a platform that allows companies to build their own apps that can automate complex or laborious you know, workflows. So again, this is a platform that ServiceNow provides to their clients to be able to design their own apps, right? And if, you, if we look into a little bit about what that Now platform does, it's a very low code, it, you know, what we call a low, clo a low code uh, platform, which means that not a lot of coding is necessary. If you're familiar with uh, websites like Wix.com, uh, which allows you know, individuals to create really nice websites, um, websites, as you know, requires knowledge of coding, but sites like Wix.com, the reason why they've done so well is because they've allowed people to create really nice, very, very beautiful websites without having any knowledge of coding whatsoever. And that's what ServiceNow has done, but for doing entire workflows for companies. So if you have a process that you have to run every single Monday or every single day throughout the week or once a month or once a quarter, and it requires a lot of hours of complex and manual labor, then the Now platform actually allows you, know, you as, a, as a client of their, of their service to create your own app that can automate that entire workflow. And this is what has caught fire you know, with regards to igniting growth for this company. Um, because the now platform is basically, as it says, it's a platform, which means that you can do just about anything. It starts off as a blank slate and they provide you the tools to be able to design your own app without having to know too much coding uh, or without having too much coding involved at all. So they were actually rated best in class, you know, platform by multiple different services. They've got a 98% retention rate that tells you how, you know, customers are appreciating their, their service, they love it, and they have a very, very low cancellation rate. They have a very deep reach into 80% of Fortune 500 companies, and they've been rated you know, among the best places to work by Fortune and other publications. And then the TAM, right? We want to know what the TAM is. And this is a direct quote from the CEO, uh, Bill McDermott. He says, technology leaders are accelerating their migration to the multi-cloud world. 75% of new app development will use low-code platforms. All these roads lead to service now. We are the control tower. So they have built a very, very compelling platform that places them at the center of where everyone is now migrating towards. They want to build apps without having to know a lot of code, a lot of complex code. And they want to be able to automate workflows that previously were extremely tedious and were extremely uh, labor intensive. And this is a slide directly from their investor day presentation. And you can see here that these are the secular trends that are kind of the tailwinds for the company. We have business model innovation on the left-hand side, multi-cloud and edge computing, application modernization, hyper automation and low code. So this is a term that we keep seeing over and over again, low code. Why? Because companies don't want to have to learn to code, right? If you know how to code, that's great. But if you don't, then you're kind of left out of this whole thing. But that's why the Now platform is so unique and so innovative because they've left coding out of it and they've allowed individuals and businesses to be able to use their tools on the fly in sort of a front end application to design the app that they want to be able to automate that workflow. And so you can see here that there's going to be a total of $8 trillion of digital spending, you know, in this entire industry combined, of which 175 billion is the total addressable market that ServiceNow is currently attacking using their current suite of products right now. So that is the market opportunity that ServiceNow is addressing. 
$175 billion opportunity. That is incredible. So this is what we want to do here. We want to com compare how does you know, the, uh, the total addressable market compare to the enterprise value today. We're going to take a look at that. So again, here is the why behind it. Remember, if I go back a few slides here, um, we want to know, um, you know, once we've seen that it has exponential revenue growth, we're going to take a look at that as well. We just saw what the total addressable market is. That is massive at $175 billion. But then remember, we want one of these, uh, one of these two points from point three, and then we want one of these points from point number four. So are they solving a major pain point or are they cutting costs? And we see that they're actually doing both. They're doing both. The main point that they're solving is the ability for companies to start automating complex and laborious workflows. That's a major pain point because companies are spending way too much time doing tedious manual tasks when they could be devoting their labor to more, uh, you know, things that aren't as easily automated or aren't as easily uh, done. So that's one major pain point that they're solving. And then the question is, are they cutting costs, right? Let's see if we can get a little bit of a bonus here. So I go back to this. This is a research study that was run by Forrester. And they found that, you know, for clients that subscribe to ServiceNow's customer service management service, that's one of this, uh, the, the, the entire suite of products that they offer, they found that the ROI, right? So for, for every dollar that they spend um, paying ServiceNow for their customer service management suite of products, the ROI on that is 176%. So for every dollar that they spend paying service now, they're generating one dollar and seventy six cents of saved uh, costs that are saved because that is labor that is now freed up to be able to do other more important things, things that you know don't require tedious, manual, repetitive work. That itself is a powerful why. That is a powerful tailwind as to why this company should continue its exponential revenue growth and to be able to eat into that total addressable market. And remember, this is just one of many, many services that they provide their customer service management tool. So I just wanted to point this out here because this is a powerful, um, you know, sort of, you know, reasoning as to why that growth rate should continue eating into that 175 billion total addressable market. And here we have a quote here from one of their clients. Uh, which says, you know, this right here, ServiceNow is a natural fit with its out-of-box automation capabilities and standard ways to build a self-service customer portal. It helped us save a lot of our problems and we avoided having to invest a lot in building our own technology. That is a major why as to why the company should continue to grow and eat into that total addressable market. So these are all tidbits that you would get if we just browse their um, investor relations website and go through the investor deck that they put together or their quarterly, um, you know, uh, you know, investor presentation. Um, sometimes you may have to listen to just one or two of their quarterly earnings calls. And these are the types of things that you'll start to, you know, pick up on. And this is why it's really important to have a checklist. Um, so if we can get, you know, each of these items checked off, then you know that we are now moving closer and closer towards a potential multi-bagger that we can you know, a very, very strong, uh, you know, investment thesis in. So this is why there is growth happening. There's also best in class market position. So remember, we want number uh, four on that list, first mover advantage, runaway network effects. So this is exactly why they have that point as well. They are best in class in their market position. They're number one on Fortune 50 uh, so ServiceNow was ranked number one on Fortune Future 50 list of companies with the best long-term growth potential. We can see that, you know, also from their filings that they have grown total, um, you know, daily active users consistently at a rate of 50% per year. So that also is very, very compelling. And at this point, you know, as the CEO said, they are the largest SaaS, or they are the fastest growing SaaS company at scale in the world. So that means that they have built scale at this point. They've hit scale and they are the fastest growing within the SaaS world. Um, so that is a very, very compelling statement. And we can see that there's still a 
lot of room left for growth with that 175 billion you know, total addressable market. So now we can turn to our Zach's research report and we can see that right here. This is a snippet of the Zach's research report that we publish for over a thousand companies. And you can see on page two, um, I love jumping to page two just because this gives you a great overview of what the company does. And you can see here that's, you know, Santa Clara based service now provides cloud computing services that automate digital workflows to accelerate enterprise IT operations. The company's now platform enables enterprises to enhance productivity by streamlining system processes. So again, um, this is exactly what we want to find. Is the company solving a pain point? Is the company, you know, enhancing the quality of life of individuals or businesses? Um, is the company cutting costs? If you can say yes to at least one of those questions, then that tells you that this growth rate that we see here, right? And we're looking at earnings on the top panel and sales growth on the bottom panel. We can see that beautiful revenue growth go growing from about, you know, two billion or one and a half billion in 2016, all the way to six billion in 2021. So that is a four bagger in just in just about five years, four times growth in five years time. That is incredible growth. And that is the why behind it. So we have to know what is the reason for that growth? And we can see that, A, they're solving a major pain point, which is helping companies automate and they're cutting costs while they're doing it. So that is a powerful dual combination as to why this should continue. And as long as they're operating in a total addressable market, that is significantly greater than what they're doing today, then you can say with pretty good confidence that this growth rate will continue going on. And so right now, as of 2021, the estimate from analysts is right around $6 billion. And what did we say the total addressable market was? You know, over $175 billion. So that's substantial growth there. So let's take a look and dive into Excel world here. And just take a look at, you know, what is the cash return on invested capital? And so I have a, an Excel model here that looks at that. And you can see here, and uh, it's a little bit of an outlier here. So let me see if I can, you know, um, you know change our y-axis to make it a little bit more, uh, you know, readable here. And you can see now a little bit clearer that their current, um, you know, rate of return on invested capital is 38%. 38%, that's their cash return on invested capital. And down here, you can see the growth of invested capital. So remember, that is the growth of the balance sheet. So as the company retains its earnings and reinvests in itself, you can see that the balance sheet will continue to grow. So as the company has identified significant investment opportunities to grow its operations, to grow its footprint around the world, to be able to service more and more clients, you can see that this is the growth rate of the invested capital, which is the denominator of ROIC. And the reason why we want to see this growing is because this is telling us that the company sees substantial opportunities for growth and therefore is retaining all of its cash flows and reinvesting back into itself um, at a maximum rate. And we can see that for ServiceNow, you know, the growth rate of this invested capital over a three year period is 42%. So that means that the company is reinvesting back into itself at an annualized rate of 42.8% or just under 45% over a five year period. And it's pretty close to that over a one year period as well. So you can see over multiple time periods, the company is essentially reinvesting in itself and growing its balance sheet at a rate of roughly 44 to 45%. That's very, very important to see here. So if we were to assume and, and project that going out, let's say to 2026, over a five year period, if it continues to grow at that roughly 44%, then the invested capital by 2026 should reach just under $32 billion if we were to continue to grow at that 42% rate. And if we assume that the cash return on invested capital remains steady at about 38%, then that follows that, you know, a very simple back of the, back of the envelope um, you know, math here tells us that their 2026 cash flow from operations could reach $12.2 billion. So what does that tell us then? 
if we were to look at that and compare that to the market cap today, you know, ServiceNow is no small company. It is not a small cap company by any stretch. You can see that the market cap is currently $126 billion. So that's a very, very large cap, you know, almost mega cap company here. But let's not be, you know, uh, let's not jump to conclusions as to, you know, oh, it's already a great, huge company. So that means the growth rate uh, or the return is probably muted going forward. That's not, you know, it at all, right? So if we see that they can potentially do $12 billion of cash flow, you know, by the end of 2026, you know, assuming this growth rate in invested capital continues and assuming that the ROIC stays steady at 38%, then, and then if it trades at an exit multiple of let's say 40 times, right? Right now it trades at 64 times. So at a $126 billion market cap, the current multiple to operating cash flow is 64 times. Let's say that that actually compresses to 40 times. Even if that were to happen, and let me just reduce this here um, so that we can make a little bit more sense of these numbers. Even if you know the, the multiple by 2026 compresses to 40 times, that still represents a multi-bagger return. And you can see that the IRR over that time period is 31% per year for the next five years. So that means that the company at the end of a five-year period will be roughly $490 billion up from 126 today. So that's not a 10x, but it's still a very, very strong market beating return because the market most likely will not do 31% per year over the next five years. So, um, and then it gets even better if we go up from there. If we hold the multiple virtually unchanged between now and 2026, and actually it's slightly lower than where it is right now. But if we assume a 60 multiple, then you can see where this goes. At that point, the compound growth uh, of, of, the, of the stock price over that time period is gonna be 42%. So this is a very simple valuation exercise here um, because remember, we have to have behind this, right? It's very easy to just assume that they're just gonna continue to grow indefinitely. And you know, for us to just you know, throw out wild numbers here, but remember, the total addressable market is 175 billion. Their sales today is just up over 5 billion. So the market penetration is still very, very small. And look at the beautiful revenue growth here. This is exactly what we want to see for a multi bagger return. This is secular growth defined. So the company has absolutely no um, you know, correlation to what the Fed is doing what economists are saying as to where, you know, the price of oil is going to go, where, you know, interest rates are headed, where commodities are headed, none of that matters. You know, this is pure, raw, secular revenue growth. This is market adoption. That's exactly what we'd like to see here. So that's, exam again, what we want to make sure is the, the case with regards to what companies we're picking to help find, you know, multi-bagger return. And we can see the same thing if we kind of go into the, uh, the Zach's valuation model, and we're go going back into the, the world of ZRS here. And, you know, if we just look at a basic valuation approach, you can see that, again, we're starting off with a, t a very tame earnings growth of about 24%. We hold that steady here. We can still see that the company is trading at a reasonable discount to its intrinsic value. So this is, again, what we want to see. As long as we're not overpaying for the company, as long as the current price is not trading at a premium over what it should be worth. And we can even model higher interest rates as well. Let's say if you're in the camp that thinks that interest rates are gonna go much higher, you know, we can model much higher interest rates and see what that does. And so as long as it doesn't lead us to you know, significant overvaluation, we can see that you know adding 300 basis points to our discount rate right here does send us a little bit you know into overvalued territory, but again over the next one year it's not overvalued at all because of its growth rate. So we're modeling 24 percent. I think it's going to be much better than 24 percent. Remember, its top line is actually better than 24 percent. So if top line revenue growth is better than that, bottom line is always going to be a little bit better or much better. Um, mainly because of operating leverage uh, effects and because the bottom line is starting from a smaller base 
And so because of operating leverage, because of the benefits of scale, uh, the bottom line earnings per share number should be growing at much faster than 24%. But that's what we're just modeling here as just a starting point. If we were to model 30% growth, which I think is closer to what they should be able to do, you know, over the next five years or so, um, I think, you know, the, the returns become very, very lucrative, you know, from that point on, as you can see here. So as I'm increasing that growth rate, by clicking on the right hand arrow, you can see where the returns are going. And it's very, very, you know, I, I, in my view, very, very attractively priced. Um, so this is, I hope was, I hope this was helpful in at least creating a framework, um, a set of rules, you know, sort of a checklist to be able to tick off and say, you know, this is everything that is going on with this company. And if it is crossing off each and every one of those items, that I believe are critical for identifying companies that could multiply several, several times over in a relatively short period, um, then, you know, you can go into this investment, you know, with confidence. Um, and then lastly, the pessimistic short-term market sentiment. Um, I love looking for companies that have, you know, items number one to six satisfied with very high conviction. And then if you can time it, if you can get lucky enough, to be able to time it such that um, the uh, the current market sentiment is currently bearish, right? It's currently bearish. Then you would get a substantial, um, you know, increase in the likelihood that um, the return is going to be, uh, you know, multi. It's going to be truly a multi bagger. Um, again, because if you can get that at a, you know, a, a, during a market sell off. What happens during market sell-offs is, you know, all companies gravitate um, to a, uh, you know, to a correlation of one. And so whether you're a good company or bad company, whether you're getting disrupted by the economic recession that, you know, is hitting, or whether you're going to actually get disrupted by whatever it is that the market is fearing that's causing the market correction, every company gets tossed out together, right? And because we know with confidence that the company has satisfied, you know, criteria numbers one through six, then we have a very, very high confidence that whatever the market is fearing um, is going to be the case for the majority of companies is not going to actually apply to ServiceNow or this company here. So that's why I like to use this handy little spreadsheet, which basically calculates, um, you can just see a quick chart of their gross profit growth, which is again, beautiful, just like their revenue growth. So we see it with very high confidence that they have, you know, secular growth on the top line. But then if you can catch one of these drops right here, this is looking at the maximum drawdown from the all time highs. This is basically telling you that the market believes that this is the maximum it wants to sell off on the stock. And we can see here, you know, through a little bit of a pattern that this 20% mark is, you know, really seems to be where the market typically wants to take it to, but not much further than that. We did see a few times it get really bad at roughly 32% at the max drawdown at that point. It got really bad at one point at a 44% max drawdown. Again, you know, that's scary to hold through, but if you were to buy this at a 20 to 25% drawdown, then of course, yeah, this would be very painful to be holding through. But again, as long as you can see this continue to scale, right? As long as we see revenues growing, as long as there is a why behind the revenue growth, and as long as that total addressable market is very, very large relative to where they're at today, then you know with confidence that this is just going to be a short term, you know, blip on the radar. And that would be a very, very viable dip. So if we can see all six of these criteria met, then you know buying these dips these major dips right here is a very very lucrative a very very um you know sort of opportune moment to be buying the stock very aggressively on that dip um, because we have a very firm confidence in the fundamentals and long-term trajectory of the company so when you do this you're actually buying in into a valuation that removes any potential euphoria that's built into the valuation that removes any excess uh expectations that removes, um, you know, over optimism, you know, potentially even by analysts. 
And by doing that, you know, you get into a multiple that prices in, that not just removes that excess euphoria, but also starts to price in some excessively bearish sentiment. That is very, very powerful in accentuating the likelihood of you netting a true multi-bagger over the long run. So I hope this was helpful for everyone. Um, if you do have any questions, I'd love to take them. You can reach uh, out to uh, myself on Twitter right here at Fresh G. You can also reach me on LinkedIn at this link right here. And if you do want to email uh, in, um, you can, uh, you know, feel free to do that. I'd love to hear from you. If you want uh, a copy of these slides or if you wanted a copy of any of these spreadsheets that I showed, again, I'd love to send that over to you. Please do email us. Um, if you are a ZRS client, please email us at zrs at zax.com. And if you are a Zax Advisor Tools client, please send us a, a note at zat at zax.com. And any questions at all, I'd love to help. Uh, I'd love to answer them. Please do uh, send them to either of these email addresses. If you do have any future ideas on what a future Lunch and Learn webinar should cover, you know, again, I'd love to hear from you on that as well. All right, everyone, take care, everyone, and hope to see you soon on the next one.